This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. If you are joining us on YouTube, you should know that this program is also available on your favorite podcast platform. This talk is with Eric Rasmussen of the University of Nevada, Reno. Eric is a well-known critic and editor, and perhaps best known for his work on finding and cataloging full descriptions of over 200 copies of Shakespeare's first folio. We will find out today what's new in the world of first folio Shakespeare. This series is funded with support from the Aoyama Gakuin University Institute of the Humanities, and also with a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Eric, thank you so much for joining us today. I think it's your afternoon and it's my early morning uh, and uh, we're in the summer here in to Tokyo and you're uh, in uh, California, but you're uh, in the Tahoe area. Is that correct right now? That's right, Tom. It's a pleasure to be with you. Afternoon, morning, wherever we are. <laughs> wherever we are in the world. Well, your name and is known to us in the biz as an editor and a critic and a uh, name that often finds a place on our bookshelves. And we could talk about that and maybe will, but I think the most immediate topic is you and your team's work uh, to give full comprehensive bibliographical descriptions of every copy of the Shakespearean first folio that you can gain access to. And it's a process that involves a lot of searching also uh, and a search that leads you and uh, others across the world and into some amazing and unsuspected locales, uh, dealing with some uh, interesting personalities, um, real immediate locales and historical locales that we can only visit in our mind's eye. Uh, as your book on uh, the folio uh, thefts shows, there are uh, intriguing narratives that accompany extant and sometimes non-extant or missing copies of the first folio. And this search is coupled with additional and I should add both joyful and baleful narratives that belong to the search itself. Uh, so you're, uh, I think you've recently authenticated a, a found first folio. And may I ask you to uh, tell us that story or any other story, anything that's hot off the press in first folio news? Well, the 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 the, the story the the story you're thinking about is was a copy in Saint Omer in the north of France. Um, and it was interesting. I, I got a um, an email out of the blue from the the a librarian at a public library who said, I think I may have found a first folio. And I said, I think you didn't, um, <laughs> because I, I get a handful of these inquiries every year or so. And the, the real problem is that in the 19th century, as soon as photolithography was invented, among the first books that they started reproducing, using the new technology was the Shakespeare First Folio. And they were so happy with how authentic it looked that they often would not put any identifying marks on it that said, this is a copy or this is a facsimile. And so these books are now 200 years old and age has conferred genuine antiquity upon them. So it's understandable if a librarian or an owner finds one and thinks, ooh, this is, a, this is, this is an original. And the difference is that in Shakespeare's time, uh, books were printed on rag bound, handmade paper with chain lines and watermarks. And in the 19th century, books were printed with wood pulp paper, usually without watermarks. And it, it, to an expert, it, it's immediately obvious uh, which is which, but to the untrained eye, not so much. So anyway, I got contacted by uh, this fellow in Saint Omer. And, and he said, I think I may have a first folio. And I said, I think you probably got a facsimile, but you know what? I'm, I'm curating an exhibition at the British Library. So I could take the Eurostar over and, and, and take a look at it for you. So I did, and, but sure enough, it, it was a first folio. And what was really interesting is this library, this public library, <laughs> unbeknownst to me, this public library owned a Gutenberg Bible. Oh. Uh, they, they had inherited their collection from a Jesuit college, uh, and that was in, in in Shakespeare's time. It was illegal uh, for Catholics to go to university, so Catholics had set up colleges along the north coast of 
uh, the continent uh, in 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 Spain in in France in in the Low Countries in which they they could send their their young men to college. And so this was this was part of a Jesuit library. And what was, what was fascinating about this copy is that the Jesuits had a longstanding tradition of theatrical performance, but the young men could not play female roles. That was a rule. And so they had gone through um, in the first folio, the uh, Henry the Fourth, part one. And every time the hostess appeared, someone had crossed off the last ESS and, and made her into a host. Uh, and so they 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 had they had made her male. And there's one place in particular when Falstaff says, "Is not my my hostess of the tavern a most sweet wench?" And someone had not only crossed off the e s s in hostess, but it crossed off wench and written fellow, um, <laughs> which is which is very sweet. I mean, it, it you just you just sort of love the idea that here are these young Jesuit students. Who have found this play? Hey, look! There aren't many women in this. We can, we 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 can do this. And so, you know, the, the use, first folios are always fun to see the signs of use. To see that that they were not treating these as priceless collectors' items, yeah. uh, which they weren't. These were these were books to be used. In this case, books to be used for a dramatic performance by um, college college actors. Uh, so that that was really fun. The the interesting thing about the aftermath of that story is the uh, when I did a, an interview with the New York Times, they said, well, is there anything particularly interesting about it? I said, well, you know, there's a name Neville that's written on the front first page of the book, happened to be the front page of The Tempest. And we know that there was a, a family named the Scaresbrick family. And Edward Scaresbrick, we know, went from England to saint Omer, And when he went, he took the the alias uh, uh, Neville. Uh, oh, so maybe um, this was his book that he brought over with him. Maybe he wrote on it when he was there. But <laughs> and that's all I said. But the headline was uh, "New Discovery Proves That Shakespeare Was a Th Secret Catholic." Oh, and, and and this went absolutely viral. Oh well, uh, but uh, what you what you pointed out is that these books not only. Uh, were used books, uh, but also uh, possess a history. Sometimes you can find it, and sometimes you can't. And uh, there, in your in your book on these searches, uh, there's just these wonderful journeys through the uh, history of literary uh, <laughs> uh, misdemeanors. So it reminded me a lot of Richard Altick's uh, book, The Scholar of Adventures, ah. you know, <laughs> and these names. Uh, I've done a lot of work on uh, Collier, but uh, Hall Halliwell Phillips, of course, and uh, these these eccentric types, and uh, the Bodleian copy that apparently was ripped uh, off the chain and uh, it goes missing for a while, and it comes back. It almost becomes a, a kind of character in, in another drama, the folio itself, uh, in a sort of, in a mystery. Uh, but recently, I think that uh, there was a folio copy that uh, sold for quite a lot of money. And I, I uh, wanted to know if you had any idea what's going on with that recent sale. Yeah, I mean, the 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 Mills College copy um, that had a really interesting history. Uh, it was owned by uh, a guy named Mad Jack Fuller, who was a, a very eccentric member of parliament. He um, he apparently. Uh, is is buried he, he created a pyramidal tomb for himself in sussex i believe and he's he's buried sitting in a i uh, sitting upright in an iron chair with a roast chicken and a bottle of port in front of him uh, uh, uh awaiting the um uh, uh the second coming um which is all very eccentric and weird and the kind of thing we like to point out of, of oh look at these look look at these the, these crazy owners but he also was a slave owner who uh, owned uh, plantations in Jamaica and uh, advocated quite quite seriously in Parliament for the retention of slavery and and so we have to always sort of take a, take our 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 our, our oh is it, are they fun are they eccentric but well wow this was a this was a bad person as well anyway Mills College in um, uh, in Oakland, tiny little uh, liberal arts school, 
um, really decided they could no longer afford to to keep this this very expensive book because these things aren't you you can't insure them and uh, and, and in any case um, sold sold for ten million dollars which is a, a a new new record for a first folio and it it it's it's a it's a very interesting market in the in the six in the seventies and eighties the um, the Japanese. Uh, were buying every first folio that came on the market, uh, many of which ended up in Meisei uh, University. And there's one, there, there's one sort of quirky copy, which I, I, I think I mentioned in the book, yeah. where we, it was a private family who owned uh, this copy. And when we first approached them, they said, uh, we're sorry, um, the, the, our husband put in the in his will that no one can see this uh, copy of the first folio until 13 years after his death. We sort of said, "Wow, that that sounds weird," <laughs> uh, but we dutifully came back 13 years later, and they wanted nothing to do with us. Oh. And the, the 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 really tricky pit here is that we know from from dealer catalog descriptions that the copy they own has a red stain on the corner of many of the pages. And we also know that a copy was stolen from the University of Manchester in, in England, the John Rylance Library, in the late 60s, that also had red stains on the corner of each page. So it could well be that this is the long lost Manchester copy and that the perhaps the husband knew this and did not want to saddle the family with the, the shame or the guilt of, of, of owning that, that stolen copy. So we've, we've never been able to see, we haven't been able to see that one yet, but that's, that's one of the few we haven't seen. Yeah. Um, it makes sense uh, that that might be the reason that people are closed off. I mean, usually uh, uh, of course, with your reputation, uh, well, there are a lot of, uh, th th there are a lot of charlatans out there and there's a long history of, um, uh, dirty dealing uh, with in the book trade, but uh, you're, by reputation, you would be very trustworthy, and you'd think that uh, <laughs> you know you uh, they would be very uh, willing. Now, you did visit the Maysay Library, uh, Maysay University Library, uh, and uh, go into the uh, vault that uh, is very difficult, I think, still to get access to. Is that right? It it is it is tricky to get access to may say it, and it's it's interesting because I have I have some very good friends and colleagues there who have been very very helpful, and one of them took me aside one day and said, you know, we're just so sorry that you have to come here to look at books that properly belong in your country. And I said, why do they belong in my country? <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it and and also may say is quietly deaccessioning uh their copies they have sold they used to have 12 they've sold two of them um they they they've kept the the what I, what many of us consider to be the important ones the heavily annotated uh copy that looks with annotations by an early scott looks like an early scottish reader and i mean my personal favorite they have william congreve's copy uh, and and the, the the 18th century playwright and Congreve's copy has a bullet hole going through it. Oh, yes. I mean, I absolutely yeah, that love yeah. that it has a bullet hole because you can't possibly have if that this is a big book. It was it's lying on a table. It would not take a bullet. Somebody had to be holding that up in this really weird riff on my first folio save my life. Uh, but I I would. I would pay a lot of money to know how how that happened. Someone, someone has gone through and carefully repaired every page where there was a bullet hole going through it. Um, I, I, I'm not positive where the bullet stopped. I like to think it was Titus because Titus is an impenetrable play, right? Um, <laughs> Titus safe is well that probably there if we could ever uncover it uh i've spoken with colleagues of mine in the shakespeare society of japan and it's amazing how little information we have about the history of those purchases why um uh someone i think it was the president of Meisei university yeah. in the late 70s or 80s during the economic bubble uh, yep. a, lot, a lot of japanese collectors in uh, areas where they were buying um modernist art and so forth and, and van gogh sunflowers yeah. uh it was a big deal at that time too yeah and warehousing it basically it was it was kind of viewed by the owners as stock and not really for public viewing or access or anything like that and may say uh, at that time may have been part of that tradition. And then all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, over time, uh, they realized they had some uh, this big treasure. 
that you might expect, well, you would expect it at the Folger Shakespeare Library or uh, and uh, uh, some uh, major world class library, uh, and uh, so. For, I've heard that, it, that people have had trouble getting access, but they do have a website, and I think they did digitize at least uh, one of it. And also, I think they have more than just the uh, first edition. They uh, have oh, they they have many, right? many seconds and thirds and and fourths and and other you know astounding. I mean, when you when you get down into this vault. It's a little creepy because you realize that that Madame Curie's notebooks must be radioactive and you're in this confined oh. space with them, <laughs> which are they wonderful Madame... artifacts to have, but they, they, they could be toxic as well. Oh, oh, yes. Um, yeah, uh, but um, they're, they're, they're at least safe. Uh, I think they're very safe there. Uh, and, uh, and so it, apparently... Uh, your book uh, came out a few years back, and I, I wasn't sure in the interim uh, if you'd been back to Japan to view more copies. Uh, and ha have you seen every uh, first folio at Meisei? Have you been able to? I, I, have, I have seen. I have seen all twelve, and now now there are only ten. Um, now there are only ten, and you don't know where the two went because uh, I, we do. One of one of them is ultimately wound up at the University of British Columbia, and okay. they. They were very, very, very excited about this 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 acquisition, and uh, it is one of the very few copies in in Canada. So that has that has gone to a public institution. The other is with a pri with a dealer who I believe is looking for a private owner, but I don't know any. I don't know that I can reveal any details. I don't know that I know them. Um, I did, but I did recently uh, take a trip to India where back in 100 years ago, in 1923, when there was a lot of hoopla about the 300th anniversary of the first folio, of course, this is the 400th anniversary, but um, the uh, a librarian down in it at the University of Rorke, a little technology school in India, said, I, 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 I've checked uh, all the descriptions of what a first folio is supposed to look, and I, I, I think we have one. And and he provided the um, uh, the dimensions, which were very big. And the Times Literary Supplement uh, noticed this and said, "Wow, um, if they have, that's amazing, and it's and it's and it's huge." And and, and with with unapologetic imperialism, said, "We think it should be sent home to the British Library." <laughs> And I, and I sort of love looking at this with a post-colonial lens. That oh no, but what, what's really fascinating is. This was announced to the world, and everyone uh, said, "Wow, this is this is this is an amazing discovery." And then it disappeared, and for sixty-five years, uh, no one heard anything of it until it was rediscovered in the nineteen eighties by a new librarian at uh, Rorke, um, who once again uh, announced it to the world. A story was published in the Wall Street Journal about this discovery of a, a, a Shakespeare folio that was in a box and it was hidden in the back of a closet. And then it went underground again. And it wasn't until after my book came out that the new librarian there in, I think, 2019 rediscovered it and said, oh, we have this, this, this copy. And so I, I said, well, I, I, I need to go uh, make, a, uh, make, make a journey and, and take a look at this. And I went to this library and, oh my goodness, they received me, the entire library staff sh showed up on the steps of the Mahatma Gandhi Library, and I, I received flowers and gifts, and there was photographers, and I, 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 guarantee, I, I do this a lot, and I can guarantee you, book historians are usually not received this way. Um, and they, 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 they took me in, and they gave me a tour, and they have a special rare books room built specifically for their treasured first folio, and they have a copy of India's constitution. It's a very, it's a lovely facility. And then, but then when I sat down with the book, I mean, the one way, as I mentioned before, that you can distinguish a book, uh, an original from a facsimile is the chain lines and the watermarks. The, the, the watermarks that were used to make paper were, were, were a tiny wire was stitched a little pattern into a, into a wire screen. And that wire would often break. And so the watermarks didn't last very long. They didn't, they could produce a certain amount of paper. And in the first folio, which took a lot of paper to print, we, we have found 21 uh, unique watermarks, watermarks that don't appear in any other book. 
save for a couple that were printed in William Jaggard's shop in the same period that the first folio was being printed. And so we, uh, all I needed to do was find one of those watermarks and I could attest that they had an original first folio. And the, the folio was huge. It was about, the margins were about an inch wider than any other I've ever seen. And I've seen many of them. Um, and I couldn't find a, a watermark anywhere. Yeah. And uh, the, the librarians were, were very disappointed. They, they've treated this book royally. They built a special uh, place for it. They'd even had carbon, carbon dating uh, uh, done on the, the, the text. And, and they showed me the results of their carbon dating test, which said, you know, this proves that this paper is hundreds of years old or the wood pulp in this paper is a hundred, the wood fibers are a hundred years old. And I said, well, well, yeah, I mean, but the, the, the paper that was used for Shakespeare's folio was made of linen. It was rag. It wouldn't have wood fibers in it. It was only uh, 19th century facsimiles that were made. And I, I think I've identified the, it was the 1966 facsimile, um, excuse me, 1866 facsimile that, um, what is probably what they have, which was the first facsimile ever produced using the new technology of photolithography. And I kind of thought that maybe because they're a technology college, they, <laughs> that would have meaning for them. But I'm, I, I, they, they were they were pretty disappointed. I'm sorry. Oh, boy. Talk about the bursting the balloon. Well, I guess the reception... <laughs> <laughs> well, that that would be uh, a very hard thing to do uh, to go in, and usually, I think you said usually there's a case. There's also the cases, and uh, am I saying this right? The Harris, uh, mm -hmm. yes, John uh, Harris facsimile. Yes, yeah, could you explain some of that to? Uh, yeah, to I mean the, the, the so in uh, in the 19th century when. Uh, wealthy owners uh, were missing a page or two of their first folio and really wanted to make a complete copy. This is the age before Xerox, before pho photolithography, before photography. And they they would hire, there was a fellow named John Harris, and he would do very meticulously crafted pen and ink facsimiles of first folio pages. And they were so brilliantly executed. I mean, they're just thing they're just works of art mm -hmm. uh and it, and the the british library at one point decided though that maybe he was a forger and so they would make him sign every page so whenever he produced one of these facsimiles for someone there's a tiny little john harris signature uh planted somewhere but whenever i find one of these uh an inner private owner's copy library's copy i'm, I'm very excited because this is, as far as I'm concerned, that the ability of someone to recreate a printed page using just pen and ink with this exactitude is is marvelous. I, it's amazing how often owners don't share my excitement because they see it as a non-original page. This is uh -huh. this is a this is a fake. This is a facsimile, uh, and and so I, I I understand that. That I mean I, I I think I mentioned this in the book, but one of the one of the most fascinating owners I know who was replacing pages was a private owner in, in Manhattan, very wealthy, lived in a six story brownstone, um, ate nothing but McDonald's uh, morning, noon and, 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 and uh, dinner. And so there were actually McDonald's wrappers, quite a few of them. And his folio had been chewed on by rats. Oh. and uh, chewed off all the corners. Now, I believe this happened. This wasn't related to the McDonald's. This was uh, it, before he had purchased it. The corners had been uh, had been chewed on at some point. And so his the way he reconstructed this is Quaritch, uh, the book dealer in London, used to have in their basement a stack of first folio pages that uh, just stray individual pages that, that should a owner ever need to make up, make a copy complete, they would have the final page of Cymbeline or something like that. And so he bought, I think, upwards of 200 individual pages. And then instead of putting them in to his copy, he cut off the corners from the new pages and then affixed them to the corners of the chewed off pages. And I was just like, 
okay, this is your book, but who does that? Oh, my. Oh, my. The, the eccentricities uh, out there. Uh, I recently spoke with Emma Smith, who's also written on the first folio, and she had a chance to go up to uh, an island off the coast of Scotland uh, to see a, a copy that was uh, rebound into three different volumes. And uh, and it turned out I, it's authentic. And have you seen that copy yet? The I, I have not seen the Butte copy. The 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 owners are are keeping it very close to the vest, which is their it's their privilege. Yeah. It's their it's their copy. I have spoken to the librarian and we have set up perhaps doing something in Zoom where she could use a light sheet and my team and I could identify the watermarks in there. It's just, it would be useful to have the data from that uh, to sort of complete the set. Yeah. Well, this is something I want to make abundantly clear. Not everybody knows this, but you have been working for years with a team uh, to go uh, into over 200 copies of the first folio page by page. Uh, and this was an adventure that was uh, done by Charlton Hinman back in the early 60s. And nobody was more relentless than Charlton. <laughs> you know, those, and, uh, and I mean, when you follow him, that, that's, uh, you know, it, it's a meticulous I guess it would be tedious work, but you look at every single page and leaf and document exactly what's happening. You look at marginalia, uh, anything is a full description of every page and the binding uh, and the histories of uh, province, uh, provenance and um, and so forth. This is a massive undertaking. So I, I imagine it's just continuing now, right? It, it just yeah, we 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 think we have now finished every uh, we because we've done the San Omer copy uh, and and we're trying to get as much data as we can on on the new Butte copy. Um, but think you know these folios keep coming to light. I mean, there was a woman who a few years ago died intestate in London, and a first folio was a, a, a sort of battered one was found among her effects, and they had to use. Uh, Forensic genealogy. I didn't even know there was such a thing as forensic genealogy to track down uh, an heir uh, uh, to who inherited this first folio. So from from a, a relative, he didn't even know he had. And so, you know, these these are kind of the antiques roadshow sorts of stories, which it's always possible. I mean, we think and it's, a, it's just an estimate. We think that there were probably 750 or so copies printed originally that was the amount that it would have taken to perhaps break even on the cost of this very expensive book and of to date we may we found less than a third of those mm -hmm. so it's you know the thing is especially small cordos could go missing they could get lost really large folios they're sort of like family bibles it's very hard to to lose one of these in the shuffle and so, you know, it, there, there, there may be, there may be more out there. We, you know, I keep, I, I keep following up leads. I go to India to track down leads. Um, but it, it, it's hard, you know, who knows uh, what, what, what will surface next. And, but, you know, you're right. The, the, all of the work we do on the book, we're hope, we, we, we hope that this will be a, of use to someone. We hope that someone will come along working on marginalia. I know we, we found one copy in the Folger that uh, we, we call the feminist copy because it was annotated by quite a number of early female owners. And female ownership is, is, is a great research interest these days. And so we, we, we kind of hope that someone may be able to use this material. We also think that anytime, a, if a book were to be stolen, we now have a complete fingerprint of that book and we can tell with some precision that exactly what you know what 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 was written on what page what pages are missing where there are ink blots where there are and and so should it be recovered they uh police can identify it as 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 happened in the case with um the raymond scott copy this was a fellow who walked into the folger shakespeare library with a copy of what looked to be a first folio claiming that he had purchased it from one of fidel castro's bodyguards and the Folger said, wow, this looks um, interesting. Yeah, we'll take a look at it. And it turned out it was a copy that had been stolen from the University of Durham. And Raymond Scott, the individual in question, 
lived a few miles away from the University of Durham in the, in the north of England, and also had suddenly acquired this collection of Lamborghinis and this taste for Dom Perignon champagne. And the guy was a nut job. He, he would show up at his trial uh, in a horse-drawn carriage with a, you know, a, a, a cigar in one hand, a cup of noodles in the other, proclaiming a horse, a horse, my kingdom for, for a horse. From, oh, my gosh. And but he but he was sentenced to six years in in prison and largely, I mean, the, the deciding um, bit of evidence was there was a, a, a small wedge like shape that had been uh, cut into Troilus and Crescent. Nobody knows why, but there was just this little very, very specific hole that had been etched out in Troilus and Cressida. And we had a record of that from before the theft and the copy had that particular uh, identifying mark. Um, so and this is the longest sentence that was ever given to someone for a rare books theft. Yeah, well, how do you steal? This is a large book for those of, uh, among our viewers who haven't seen one. It's large. It's, uh, it, it would be very difficult to steal. Uh, you know, you could see these some of these smaller quarto editions or uh, duodecimo, or something slipping into someone's pocket and they are getting they get past the guards. How does that happen? How do you get the entire book out of the library? Uh, <laughs> well, this 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 particular theft um, was was during an exhibition where they had uh, in 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 the exhibition cases they had a number of the treasures of the library, including ninth century ma manuscripts and the Anglo-Saxon King Alfred and things like things of this nature. And apparent, my my recollection is that their first folio. Every they they used to take it out of the the exhibition case at night and or replace it with a facsimile. In any case, they hadn't done that this particular. And thieves broke in and stole a, about a dozen items. Um, many of the first folio has been recovered, but many of the items have, have, are, are lost. Mm -hmm. And so this was this was an actual kind of missing impossible theft. Where uh, and, and you know it, the problem is university libraries often don't have the sophisticated uh, uh, anti theft systems uh, that 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 you would you might think that these million dollar items ought to have but no 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 one can afford that and and often no one expects that that someone's going to break into a library um, so that was that was that that was that was a big that was a big theft. I mean, we're really I'm really pleased for Durham that the copy has come back, but I but I'm I'm I, I remain uh, you know saddened that that the other items all all of them unique all of them priceless are are are, are gone. Yeah. Uh, well, how uh, if I may ask that this takes a a lot of resources to be able to do all of this traveling to look around to ha have a team. Uh, people doing this, so uh, your your funding sources, if that's uh, permissible to ask, do, uh, how do you fund all of this travel and all of these? Uh, you know, people get paid for doing this. It seems like it's a an, an enormous project. Yeah, I mean the 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 interesting thing is you when traces back its history. So it began with a guy named Anthony James West, who. Um, was a, uh, a, a, a British, uh, uh, an Englishman who went to Harvard, did an MBA in the 1960s, and then took British management or, or took American business management practices back to England where no one was really thinking that way. Mm -hmm. And he became a partner in Booz yeah. Allen, the management consultant firm. He ran their South America office in Rio de Janeiro. He was one of Forbes's richer men in the world and had a midlife crisis in, in his 50s and decided he really, his real love was, was Shakespeare and he wanted to go do a PhD. So he went to University College London uh, to, to work on his doctorate. And when he was looking for a, um, uh, a dissertation idea, his, his supervisor said, well, you know, no one's done a census of the first folio since Sidney Lee back in 1903. Why didn't you do that? And so Anthony threw himself into it uh, with, with verb, and he spent 15 years traversing the world, looking for first folios. He found 70 more 
than we knew of in Lee's census, and uh, which is amazing. Um, but he also spent his entire personal fortune, and I never decided whether that was noble or foolish. Um, but he, you know, it, it and then and, and what Anthony had done is he he discovered these things, but he'd not spent much time with them. He would sort of authenticate, take a few notes, and then with the intent of coming back. And so I put he approached me and and I put together a team of research assistants largely professional friends of mine and grad students of mine. And we threw ourselves into it wholeheartedly. We, we, we had some research funding for my, from my university, but basically people were, were traveling on the cheap and, 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 and working gratis. And, and, and we, we then went back to each copy. And as you say, uh, really spent some time to do, to do full analyses uh, and recording the, the the data from from each one, um, and you know it has been largely a labor of love. Um, it's been it's been kind of wonderful in this first folio year to see how many people are traveling around the world carrying our copies of the uh, the first folio catalog. I know Greg Doran, the uh, the former artistic director of uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company is on a personal first folio journey and he's going around the world um, with a copy of our catalog tucked under his arm. He calls it his bar decker, which I think is very sweet. <laughs> oh, that is. So what year are we talking here? Uh, roughly the beginning of your project. So, so Anthony started his work in uh, the 1990s. Um, my team and I came in in the early 2000s and worked on it for about a solid decade and then brought out the catalog in, in 2011, 2012. And we've continued to update it since with the, uh, with, with, with the new discoveries. And one of, one of the real problems was deciding how you organize a catalog such as this. And one of the decisions Anthony had made, he's, he wanted to do it geographically, which makes a kind of sense. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones that are in the British Isles, the ones that are in America, the ones that are in uh, the rest of the world. The problem, of course, is that these, these, these are portable. So <laughs> many of them have migrated to, to different countries and, 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 and different places since then. So simply coming up with a, with a system for how you, uh, we, 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 have, we, have, we have numbers, but it, it's all, it's, 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 it's very difficult. And it, I'm not, I don't get upset when one moves from Tokyo to British Columbia, <laughs> but, it, but it does mean that I've got to relocate that thing. That's right. Um, that's right. Uh, they keep moving. Uh, it's, it's not like you're doing a, an archaeological site that stays where it is, at least, you know. Uh, and um, also, the uh, things happen. You know, you, you have uh, fire, flood, all kinds of things can happen. You have eccentric personalities who can walk out of uh, Durham University Library with a copy. And um, so uh, so this is just it's never ending. I just think that it's just wonderful to have a project that's so much fun for so many people uh, that gives you work to do that's enjoyable, even though it could be tedious at times, that uh, that doesn't have an, an end date. Um, well, you are uh, your your career, you. Uh, are the uh, or, or I think uh, well you worked with Jonathan Bate on the RSC uh, editions of Shakespeare. You're involved with the uh, inter Internet Shakespeare editions. I saw your name there uh, uh, some years ago. And uh, uh, there's uh, I, I I have I know the people who are doing that or some of the people. Um, and. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about your editorial work also that uh, and not and not just let everything be overshadowed by first folio. Uh, you uh, are you are involved with any editorial projects now or. Um... Yeah, I'm I am on the the board of a the new new Cambridge Shakespeare, which has just uh, just got gotten off the ground quite quite fascinatingly is the the general editors are three are, th are three female scholars very very talented female scholars who it and it, there has been such a male dominance in the editing of Shakespeare for so long 
Um, there, there's even a story about how when um, the, the, the Arden Shakespeare, uh, when it was suggested that, that they, they ask a woman to edit Hamlet, one of the general editors quit rather than, <laughs> than allow this to happen. And, and so it, it, it's, a, it's a really nice sea change um, to see uh, a, a diversity of voices um, coming, coming into editing. And, you know, I, we, as you mentioned, Jonathan Bate and I um, did, the, the, did uh, the complete works for the Royal Shakespeare Company. And, and that, was, that was a lot of, that was really interesting because we were working fairly closely with the actors. And, and often there's, there's a dis, the disjunction between the, 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 the editors, the critics, and the performers. And the two often don't talk to each other. And it, what we would do, um, and it was it was it was quite wonderful, um, is if if you discover a a textual issue, for instance, um, there's a line at the, the 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 climactic line of Much Ado About Nothing, is when Benedict says to Beatrice, "Peace, I will stop your mouth." And he kisses her, and then he shuts her up for the rest of the line for the rest of the play, and and that's an interesting moment because it's like, oh, okay, he won, and there's this, you know, and it the the audience applauds, the people on stage applaud, but fine. But the problem is that that's not Benedict's line in either the early quartos or the early folios. It's Leonardo's line, and Leonardo. Uh, Hero's father, Beatrice's uncle, and the editor, an editor in Louis Theobald in 1730, um, decided, "Oh, this can't be Leonardo," and he assigned it to Benedict. And every editor since then has given that line to Benedict. We went into a, the rehearsal room, and uh, the RSC actors happened to be uh, doing much ado about nothing, and said, "Hey, is there any way?" this line can work if it's Leonardo's. And the act, without missing a beat, the actor playing Leonardo stepped up and he cupped Benedict's head and he cupped Beatrice's head and he brought them together in a kiss and he said, peace, let me stop your mouth. And we all went, oh my gosh, it works. And it not only works, it's better. It's better. It, it's yeah. not it's better. Benedict yeah. having uh, dominance over Beatrice. It's Leonardo fulfilling the the plan that he had he had hatched all along of bringing the two of them together, and and it's it's moments like that where you can really interact with, um, with with you know you I they can they can teach actors can teach editors things as well as editors teaching actors things. And in our, our, our current, the second edition that we just brought out for the RSC, we went through and stripped out all of the editorial stage directions. So every time, I mean, one of the things that's very tricky about um, modern editions of Shakespeare is that editors feel compelled to put in stage directions to help readers with the stage action. And that's fine. There's nothing inherently wrong with that, except most actors, most students, don't know that those those stage directions in brackets are not part of the authentic text. They're just editors guesses at what's what's happening there. And and editors often get things wrong. I mean, it, it's just it's it's so remarkable in the history of editing. You know, it was Nicholas Rowe, the first editor back in 1709, who said that that uh, Lear uh, and, and the Fool are on a heath. Everybody talks about the heath. There's no heath in King Lear. That's just Nicholas Rowe saying they're on a heath. Um, anyway, so what, what we decided to do, um, because we're working with the Royal Shakespeare Company, is to take out the all of those editorially added stage directions and replace them with things that RSC productions have actually done at those moments in the play. And it's... It, and, and it really gets interesting when they've done different things, because, you know, does Hamlet uh, address, you know, a little more than kin and less than kind, you know, directly to Claudius? Does he say it aside? Does he say it to his shoe? Um, it, 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 it matters to me, for my students, to, to, get, to get the idea of there is no one 
way to do this. There are multiple ways to do this. There, there, there are differing interpretations. Some can have more validity than others, and some can be more appealing. But giving them not simply my idea of what that stage direction should be, but uh really sort of collaborating with actors and directors and here are uh two or three different ways that this could be done i think really gets them thinking about the multiple possibilities that are that are latent in these plays and the and maybe the reasons why you might want to see more than one production to, to see you know a, 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 another approach some people who are doing something differently maybe a way you haven't hadn't thought of before so i'm very proud of uh, are, are taking the step in doing this. And it really, you know, before the RSC edition was not in name only, but it had less direct links to the Royal Shakespeare Company than than we do now. So I'm 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 very pleased by this and hope hope that people have a lot of uh, get get some real get some get some good use out of it. Um, you mentioned the Internet Shakespeare with uh, and, and, and that you, you know some people who are working on that project. Yeah. This, again, was spearheaded by uh, a man named Mike, Michael Best, yeah. who really saw that the electronic medium gives us the opportunity to do things that we don't have to do in print. You know, if there is a textual variant that, you know, very famously, when Othello commits suicide, uh, there, it, it, it's a question of whether he sees himself as a as as a, a base Indian who threw away, uh, threw away a pearl that he didn't understand its price. Was it was he a savage who didn't get the value of it, or was he the base Judean who threw away a pearl? Well, this is like Judas uh, and, and betraying Christ. Um, that's a very different reading, and. In, in print, you have to select one or the other, but in in the electronic mode, you could you could have a text that kind of morphs quietly between the two and alerts readers that there's a difference there. And again, you know, as I was just talking about with the stage directions, gives them the multiple possibilities that are that are in this text without necessarily having an editor pick one and saying, yes, that's the one you've got to go with. Yeah, well, I do some work in digital humanities. Uh, I do a lot of work there um, over the past uh, ten years or so, and uh, in particular, and uh, in this series, we talked with uh, Janelle Jenstad, and she uh, explained some of the uh, technical challenges that uh, in the history of that. Uh, and um, I've discussed with several other scholars some of the problems. Uh, Tiffany Stern, uh, uh, they're trying to make the decision that uh, Arden, what you know, how how right. much do you digitize? Do you make a museum out of the text? And no, nobody wants to do that. And I'm thinking, no, you don't need to. And, and you have Wikipedia, you have all kinds of online resources to to click to if you're online reading an edition. But I still use the. Uh, uh, it was the David Bevington at uh, Chicago where you were schooled, right? Uh, that edition, and it's uh, still out there. Uh, Janelle made sure that we that you have access to it, even though they're kind of rebuilding things uh, within uh, more durable programming. Uh, it's it's really a digital um, equivalent of trying to preserve uh, real uh, hard copy editions. You know, you have to you have to build a, a space there that uh, that will be usable 20, 20, 30 years from now, but. Uh, uh, you uh, and 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 the yeah. and the tr and the tricky thing about about digital humanities and it's uh, people like David Scott Caston have been arguing for years is that if you own a book if you own David Bevington Shakespeare and it's on your shelf you have that you can go to that you can refer to it it's there yeah. if you're relying on a digital platform that it is some somebody else maintains it and owns it it could it could disappear. It could not be there anymore. Yeah. And this has happened recently with the the Cambridge uh, edition of Ben Johnson, that they they made a decision when they published this to publish the plays and the introductions and the notes, but put a, put a lot of the textual essays and, and the other kinds of material on a digital platform with the assurance that it would be kept running as long as, as Cambridge University Press. Well, it now appears that that may not be the case, and it may may vanish uh, in in the near future. And and many of us are are just up in arms. Uh, many of us who supported the 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 electronic 
text, textual revolution about look at all look what we can do now that we weren't we aren't limited to page counts anymore, and 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 we're at, at the point now with with so many of these things no longer available. Um, just just wondering what 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 wondering what we should do, or I mean, we're scrambling obviously to find a new yeah. a new home, and probably will, but. Yeah. Well, uh, one solution that I think is uh, extremely viable, and I've heard people who are uh, the podcast of people talking about this, is that if you build it with a certain way, you can put the whole thing on a uh, USB and yeah. you can uh, replicate the USB and you can actually own a copy of the USB and it all works offline uh, even. Uh Yes, I think I'm right. Without well, you're not depending on a bunch of servers that you have to bounce things off of. But the uh, it's such a uh, a great teaching uh, tool now that we have overhead projectors in every classroom. We can put you know the text up there and click, and there's a fine annotation. And you know I'm in a second language situation, so it's enormously right. helpful to be able to do that. Uh, and uh, a lot of my better students are still very text bound, right? But uh, during class, uh, it's great to have that. Uh, do you have uh, one of the great things I think that what I'm, I'm hoping for? I'm somewhere behind me. I have uh, Peter Blaney's two volume work on the you know the entire everything, and. And I was looking for some information on a a, a printer uh, and publisher, uh, uh, Reginald Wolf, in the mid 16th century, and I was going through, and it led me to a footnote in Volume One, and then I had to go to Volume Two and look up something, and go, and it was, and I, you, you wonder if you know uh, it was some kind of joke being played on me. Uh, but I think I was thinking if there were some way to digitize this, and I'm thinking also about uh, catalogs like yours and so forth, sure. they're they, in some ways much more usable with uh, searchable searchability and so forth. And now that we have the uh, the um, space to put it on, you know, it used to be the hard drive space was a, a real commodity. And now we have kind of limitless space for things, images and all kinds of things. So uh, where do you think that's going? I it, it it would be I mean the the huge problem is that um, publishers don't have the money and but they own the copyright and so we have been uh, you know we have been trying to get I mean as as you say um, you know Peter Blaney's uh, work any any kind of reference work certainly our catalog of first folios doesn't have to exist in a in a thousand page uh volume it would be so much more accessible electronically and the uh, it, because you because because publishers references divisions have been affected by university uh monograph budgets you know shrinking to to nothingness and they they are not in my experience they they are they are not inclined to go to the expense of of putting something up uh, electronically and digitally, and it's not something that the individual authors have the the legal capacity to do because we don't we don't hold the, co the copyright. So I, I I I will I will I will cite you. I will I will, I will tell my publishers that you know the world is waiting, uh, or, or or the handful of users who who really do need it on occasion and do want to look at something specific. Uh, it, it would make all the sense in the world to have these. And if if they had come out a decade later, now, you know, now would be a place where you, you could make an argument. It, it just needs to be digital. We don't need to do it. There does not need to be a, a hard copy of 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 this volume. And I'm I'm one of the general editors of the New Variorum Shakespeare. And that's what we're we have moved with the New Variorum to a completely digital platform. Yeah. And the 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 final volumes that are currently in the pipeline, um, we will we will have in hardcover version, but there too, a very arm. Oh my God. Oh my goodness. Um, that, that script, that, that, that's hypertext, you know, waiting to happen. Yeah. And, uh, it, it, it really is great. We were partnering with Texas A&M, yeah. uh, to, to 
make make that in, in an entirely digital project, which is which is which is very gratifying. Yeah, and you can do both. Uh, I, because I, I I'm like you. I I don't uh, you know you, you have to have electricity. You have to you know the the, uh, the power has to be on, and the book seems more trustworthy. Of course, books can be um, lost and subject to all kinds of things, but uh, both can be done. I, we spoke with. Uh, uh, well, on this series with Laura Mandel at uh, A and M, Texas A and M, uh, and she brought us uh, up to date with what they were doing s so far. But I I'm seeing now more um, intervention from the uh, scholarly uh, community because you know with you know, Internet Archive and now uh, Google will just throw up an entire book, and it's very useful to uh, have that book uh, if you're using it for research. To, to oh, I you know. Uh, I have books behind me and you do too, I'm sure with all kinds of, um, uh, well, not dog eared, but I put little sticky notes in places and write little notes. And then I forget what it was all about and so forth. You know, I end up uh, rediscovering something or uh, that sort of thing. So the, I do find the digital research um, uh, good, but uh, there are just a lot of things that you, you like thumbing through the pages because there's a type of browsing. There's a serendipity, I guess is the word I'm looking for. Uh, that uh, only happens uh, in a in a bookshop or in a library in a personal collection, um, but uh, this this history uh, of personal collection, the thing that you're doing is so transferable and scalable to other types of knowledge. It isn't just limited to the first folio. I I, I think so, and and you know there have been sporadic uh, catalog resumes of important books, um, Galileo uh, and, and, and so forth. But I, I, I'd like to see it with others. I know there's, there's a guy in Amsterdam named Will Sutton who wants to do a catalog of the uh, extant copies of the, the Shakespeare sonnets. Well, I think they're only 13, so I don't think it'll take him a long time, but it, it's, it's that kind of thing that, yeah, that'd be kind of useful to see, you know, what, what, what the watermarks are, what the, those, 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 that sort of data. Um, and, and who knows what, what use it will be. Um, I, I'm not sure there are going to be teams going around the world looking at leaves of grass, but maybe. Well, you never know. Uh, I found myself a few years back diving into Fulleritz, uh, uh, Office of the Rebels, the thing, that, uh, 1908. And uh, it was put up on Internet Archive. And suddenly I found out, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if they did uh, make an ass's head in the Office of the Rebels. Now, I could look through the entire catalog or I could search you know the spellings were different and that sort of thing but you and it's just amazing what you could find with um in some cases going kind of down uh in you know into a rabbit hole uh on certain things but uh i i'm a, i'm a big uh advocate of both um uh, and uh it, i have kept you now for over an hour uh, Eric, I know that you're busy. I, it, just the incredible amount of work that you have done uh, th through throughout your career. Is there anything that we need to know about that's maybe coming up soon or uh, that you'd like to uh, get out there? <laughs> Give an advanced preview for. Um, <laughs> I, the, I mean, the, the, this this is this is the folio. This is the folio's birthday year, yeah. and so there are. Uh, uh, all sorts of uh, events and happenings. I'm I, I've been involved with a uh, a documentary, a two hour long documentary that's being put together by uh, uh, Richard Denton, um, who is he he and his wife did the Shakespeare Uncovered series, and they're doing such good, interesting things with this with this film. They they found a uh, a, a cartographer or a calligrapher. In, in Brussels, who is emulating uh, Elizabethan secretarial hand, and he is producing what the printer's copy for the first folio must have looked like, including the uh, the way certain 
letters might have been misread and things like that. Um, it, it's uh, and Emma Smith is in, in it and Tiffany Stern and Jonathan Bate. Um, so I it will be out in November and I, I, I hope everyone enjoys it. OK, that's just wonderful. Well, um, I'd like to ask you to stay for a moment after we finish. But uh, I wanted to thank uh, you so much for coming on kind of on short notice. And uh, I'm sure that uh, my colleagues here in Japan who uh, kind of do, who watch these things, we have a small but very enthusi enthusiastic art. Uh, I'm sorry, audience. Uh, we're, we're, fit fit not, audience, not, though, few, but <laughs> yeah, and, and specialized in students and growing. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Tom. It's been a pleasure.